Uh, if people could take their seats, um, it would be great to get started uh, here on time with our voices group. Uh, and this is the uh, Ali Voices uh, Spoken Word Performance Ensemble. Uh, and this group is has been working for a couple of months uh, developing uh, their performance about sports uh, and culture, uh, race, gender, uh, and starting in 1919 with the Black Sox scandal. That's what got them started, but it's gone from there. So please hold your applause until the end. Uh, and uh, I'd like uh, the voices performers to come out. So Louise, Brian, Will, Alan, Jesse, the playwright, Barbara, the director, and Tony, uh, one of the other readers. So thank you very much, and we're looking forward to this performance. Whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball. So declared cultural, cultural historian Jacques Barzon in 1954. Indeed, baseball has been an integral part of American culture for well over a century. Back in the day, the sport was considered healthy, both physically and morally, until 1919. It was 100 years ago that the heavily favored Chicago White Sox lost the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. It was widely suspected and later confirmed that some of the White Sox players had been paid off by gambling interests to play poorly. Outfielder Shoeless Joe Ju 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 Jackson, an illiterate country boy from South Carolina and one of the greatest hitters to ever play the game, confessed to the alleged fix before a grand jury. Legend has it that as he left the courthouse, he was confronted by a young fan. Say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. But it was so. The so-called Black Sox scandal found its way into baseball lore, dramatized in such movies as Eight Men Out and Field of Dreams, and inserted itself into American culture. F. Scott Fitzgerald referenced the matter in The Great Great Gatsby, when the narrator asks Gatsby about a certain man he has just met. Who is he anyway, an actor? No. A dentist? No, he's a gambler. He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fixed the World Series? The idea staggered me. I remembered, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919. But if I had thought of it at all, I would have thought of it as something that merely happened, the end of an inevitable chain. It never occurred to me that one man could start to play with the faith of 50 million people. How did he happen to do that? He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? They can't get him on sport. He's a smart man. In fact, the man commonly believed to be responsible for the fix, racketeer Arnold Rothstein, was never indicted. The eight players implicated in the scheme were acquitted by a jury, but the first commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, took a hard line. If I catch any crook in baseball, I'll go to any means and do anything possible to see that he gets a real penalty for his offense. Regardless of the verdict of juries, no player that throws a ball game, no player that undertakes or promises to throw a ball game, no player that sits in a conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means and throwing ball games are planned and discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball again. The eight implicated players, including shoeless Joe Jackson, were banned for life. Jackson's punishment has stirred controversy 
and he has been romanticized in film and poetry, including this verse by Nelson Algren. Do not be remembering the most natural man ever to wear spiked shoes. The canniest fielder and the longest hitter, who squatted on his heels in a uniform muddied at the knees, till the bleacher shadows grew long behind him. Who made an X for his name, and couldn't argue with Comiskey's sleepers. But who could pick a line drive out of the air ten feet outside the foul line, and rifle anything home from anywhere in the park. For shoeless Joe is gone. Long gone. A long yellow grass blade between his teeth and the bleacher shadows behind him. For decades, the Lords of Baseball continued its zero tolerance policy regarding gambling. Pete Rose, in a career spanning 24 years, ending in the 1980s, collected more hits than anyone before or since. But he was addicted to gambling. After it was determined that as a player and a manager, he had bet on baseball games, he received a lifetime ban from the commissioner, just like she was Joe. I don't like to be compared to Joe Jackson because he, I think, took money to throw World Series games. Well, I know I bet on my own team to win. That's a big difference there, though. But both of us were wrong. Major League Baseball's attitude toward gambling has experienced a shift in recent years. It had long prohibited gambling kiosks inside a club stadium. But this year, the Chicago Cubs have considered opening one at Wrigley Field. According to a spokesperson, pardon me, a spokesperson for the major leagues. We will work with our clubs to explore opportunities presented by rapidly evolving sports betting landscape in a socially responsible manner. To date, Pete Rose, the most prolific hitter in history, is still deemed not qualified for the Hall of Fame because he bet on baseball games. Attacks on a sport's integrity have not been restricted to baseball. In about on November 14, 1947, middleweight Jake LaMotta, who was depicted by Robert De Niro in the film Raging Bull, was knocked out in the fourth round. Suspecting the fight was fixed, the New York State Athletic Commission withheld purses for the fight and suspended LaMotta. LaMotta later admitted to throwing the fight to gain favor with the Mafia. The first round, a couple of belts to his head, and I see a glassy look coming over his eyes. Jesus Christ, a couple of jabs and he's going to fall down? I began to panic a little. I was supposed to be throwing a fight to this guy, and it looked like I was going to end up holding him on his feet. By the fourth round, if there was anybody in the garden who didn't know what was happening, he must have been dead drunk. The throne fight and a payment of $20,000 to the Mafia earned Lamana a title bout against world middleweight champion Marcel Serdan. American sports institutions and stars have always been more tolerant of choosing to win than of throwing a game. In 2014, New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady was accused of using illegally deflated footballs in a playoff game. We're here with Hall of Fame quarterback Joe Montana. Joe, what do you think of this deflate game scandal? I think the Patriots were cheating, and I applaud them for it. Do? I don't get it. You do? Sure. They always say, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. So they're trying hard. You know, everybody does everything they can to get a bit of an edge. It's a game. Everybody wants to win. So you do whatever you can to make it happen. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. Vince Lombardi legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers. Nice guys finish last. Leo DeRocher, manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. But when the great scorer comes to write against your name, he marks not that whether you won or lost, but how you played the game. Graham Rice, renowned sports writer. Lance Armstrong, you won seven Tour de France races after recovering from metastatic cancer. You are an inspiration, the most celebrated cyclist in history. 
What's the secret of your success? Oh, it's simple. Success comes from training harder, living better, and digging deeper than the others. After years of denying that he had taken banned drugs and attacking his teammates and competitors who attempted to expose him, in 2013, Armstrong finally admitted to using banned substances for years. You let a lot of people down, Lance. What made you do it? All I can say is, I was driven. Driven by a ruthless desire to win. After recovering from cancer, you seem better than ever. Oh, it was a perfect story. But it wasn't true. It was one big lie. And now, some coaching tips from our own Alan Rubin. To some, challenges are exhausting. To others, they are opportunities in waiting. Don't whine. Find the positive in difficult situations. Don't get angry. Get better. Placing blame on others is easy. Taking responsibility for yourself is empowering. One of my favorite coaching moments came from watching Sherry Cole, coach of American women's basketball team at the World University Games a few years back. During practice in an intra-squad scrimmage, Kalina Requeta Lewis came off a great screen and Bria Hartley delivered her a perfect pass. Kalina then knocked down a three-point basket. The two started to retreat back to the other end to play defense. Before they can get set, Coach Sherry Cole stopped playing. Those points don't count. Kalina, did you point to Bria for delivering you a great pass? My bad, Coach. Great pass, Bria. The lesson, you stop play to point out something good a player had done. I use this in my coaching, and it really helps build up players' confidence. The end result isn't the only thing. It isn't even the main thing. Emil Griffith, a champion prize fighter, is best remembered for causing the death of Benny Kidd Perret in the ring in 1962. The event haunted Griffith for the rest of his life. Later, he came out as a bisexual. <clears throat> I keep thinking how strange it is. I kill a man, and most people understand and forgive me. However, when I love a man, to so many people, this is an unforgivable, an unforgivable sin. This makes me an evil person. So even though I never went to jail, I've been in prison almost all my life. Bruce Jenner won the men's decathlon in the 1976 Montreal Olympics, becoming one of the most famous athletes in the world. In 2015, Bruce came out as a trans woman named Caitlin. Sports saved my life. Being a successful high school athlete helped make me popular and appear masculine to those around me because that's what everyone wants to believe. Underneath my suit, I have a bra and pantyhose and this and that, and I think to myself, they know nothing about me. I'd walk off the stage and I'd feel like a liar. And I would say, damn, I can't tell my story. There's so much more to me than those 48 hours in the stadium and I can't talk about it. It was really frustrating. You get mad at yourself. Little did they know, I was totally empty inside. The 1993 movie, A League of Their Own, is a fictionalized account of the All-American Girls Basketball League, which operated between 1943 and 1954. Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. Well, a lot has changed since the League of Their Own. The biggest difference is young girls growing up today have female role models. We still get women saying, we watched that movie before our championship game. It was probably the most amazing experience in all of our lives. It changed us. It changed the audience. It changed women's and girls' perspectives. When people have sports in their lives, they're changed. Sports matters. In 
In 1973, at the peak of the women's liberation movement, former United States champion Billy Riggs, Bobby Riggs, challenged Billie Jean King, winner of 39 Grand Slam titles, to an exhibition match. It became a veritable applause celeb, a battle of the sexes. Feminist Billie Jean King has successfully fought for equal pay for women in the United States Open Tennis Tournament. As for Riggs, oh, don't get me wrong. I love women, in the bedroom and in the kitchen. Rick's son Larry recalls his late father's modus operandi. He only did this for publicity. He said to me, Larry, this is really working. These women are really buying into all this stuff that I'm saying. The women's movement can't stand me. They hate me. This couldn't be better PR. They're buying into this hook, line, and sinker. I warned him that he was more interested in promoting the match than he was about getting in shape. Billie Jean King had a different approach. She played her own game, rested up, non-communicative, preparing herself mentally, emotionally, and physically. I knew the match was about social change, and I was really nervous and felt like the whole world was on my shoulders. I said, hey, Dad. This is worrying me a little bit. This Billy G. King, Dean King is a really good player. You know this is not going to be easy. I know that, but don't forget, I'm the Wimbledon champion, not you. On September 22nd, 1973, 90 million viewers turned in worldwide and watched Billy Jean King thrash Bobby Riggs in straight sets. When he jumped over the net at the end of the match, he said, I should have taken you more seriously. Dad's chauvinistic persona was all an act. The night before he died in 1955, he and Billie Jean talked. I want you to know that I love you a lot. I love you too, Billy. And we did something big together. Bobby, we did. On July 7th, 2019, the United States women's soccer team won its fourth World Cup championship. A few hours later, the American men's team lost to Mexico in a regional championship. Co-captain Megan Rapino was outspoken about what she calls an unfair pay structure at U.S. soccer. I think we're done with are we worth it? Should we have equal pay? Is the market the same? Yada, yada, yada. We, all players, every single player at this World Cup, put on the most incredible show that you could ever ask for. We can't do anything more to impress more, to be better ambassadors, to take on more, to play better, to do anything. It is time to move that conversation forward to the next step. For the longest time, female reporters were not allowed in the male athletes' locker rooms for post-game interviews. This put them at a disadvantage when compared with male reporters. When the issue arose during the 1977 World Series, baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn reaffirmed that women would be barred from the team's locker rooms. A federal lawsuit by, uh, brought by sports reporter Melissa Lutke resulted in this policy being declared discriminatory and illegal. Gradually, the policy changed, but that didn't mean the players were on board. As, rec as recently as 2017, Lucky said, With the 14th Amendment on my side, my case cemented the legal foothold on which thousands of women sports reporters rely today. Yet, as decades go by, I appreciate more and more an age-old lesson. While courts decide our laws, it's up to us as a society to adjust our attitudes. We've still got a long way to go. Reporter Lisa Saxon later explained, Going in the locker room, Knox would get in my stomach. It actually is a physically uncomfortable thing to do because you don't know what you would face. And at the very least, you would have jock straps thrown at you and dirty undergarments. And that was an everyday occurrence. And then you would just build out of that what might happen. And you just hope for the best when you went in. 
Detroit Tigers pitcher Jack Morris once said to a woman reporter, I don't talk to people when I'm naked, especially women, unless they're on top of me or I'm on top of them. Augusta National Golf Club hosts the Masters Tournament each year. In 23, protests arose because women were barred from membership in the club. Club Chairman Woody Johnson declared, Our membership is single gender, just as many other organizations and clubs all across America. This would include junior leagues, sororities, fraternities, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and countless others. And we all have a moral and legal right to organize our clubs the way we wish. There may well come a day when women will be invited to join our membership, but that timetable will be ours and not at the point of a bayonet. Women were finally admitted nine years later in 2012. And in 2019, the club hosted the first Augusta National Women's Amateur Championship. Augusta National has a long history of racial discrimination as well, dating to its founding by Cliff Roberts in 1932. As long as I'm alive, all golfers will be white and all caddies will be black. Beginning late in the 19th century, by virtue of a gentleman's agreement among the owners of the teams, Negroes were barred from playing Major League Baseball. So they formed their own leagues. Steve Klepitar, Ali's own poet, has penned a song praising the Negro Leagues. Song in the wind, a Kansas City wind rising in shadow, snapping at dust like satchel's curve. Hitter dazed on his heels, or a streaking blur along the river, cool Papa Bell sliding into second base. Listen to the clean song struggling behind forbidden lines, rising like Bill Foster's fastball, or a Josh Gibson blast disappearing in a thousand shirt sleeves and white dresses, bleachers on a steamy Pittsburgh night. Hear the song of young men. See them in old photographs, lean and smiling, eager with joy of leather and wood, white lime on grass, dust popping from the bases, hot summer wind in every city from Houston to New York, Harlem to Mobile, beautiful and strong. And free, at least in the game's, at least in the game's sweet possibilities, in opposition of muscle, heart, and will, in true equality of guts and mind and skill. See them crowding behind the color line. See them in shadow. Cheer now as they emerge into light. Judy Johnson and Willie L. Diablo Wells. Oscar Charleston and Luke Foster. Bud Leonard and Buck O'Neill. Let all their names become faces and prophetic as comets, fitting as the night game lights or brilliant patterns in the stars. Write their numbers and their fame and let their faces blaze across the sky. Many of the Negro League players were exceptional, as the big league players were well aware. In 1936, Yankee prospect Joe DiMaggio faced the star Negro League pitcher Satchel Paige in an exhibition game. Afterwards, a Yankee scout watching the game wired the big club a report. DiMaggio, everything we hoped he'd be. Hit Satch, one for four. The color line persisted until 1947, when general manager Branch Rickey promoted Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers. They knew the path would be challenging. The enemy will be out in force. You can't meet the enemy on his low ground. You want a player who hasn't got the guts to fight back? No. I want a player who's got the guts to not fight back. You give me a uniform. You give me a number on my back, and I'll give you the guts. The experiment turned out every bit as tough as they expected. Some Dodger players refused to play alongside a black man. 
During games, when Robinson came up the bat, opposing players would taunt him mercilessly. You look in the mirror. This is a white man's game. Get that through your thick monkey skull. You don't belong here. Why don't you put on a show? Do a little shuffle. I suppose we let them do this. These men have to live with themselves. You're in this thing. You don't have the right to pull out from the backing of people that believe in you. If you fight, they'll say that you're in over your head. There isn't anything I can do about it? Yes, you can hit, get on base, and score runs. <coughs> and that he did. As the story goes, one time Cincinnati fans were giving Robinson a particularly tough time at the Dodgers took the field. In a show of support, Pee Wee Reese temporarily left his position at shortstop and traveled over to Robinson at first base and put his arm around the rookie, silencing the crowd, which was awed by the act of racial empathy by Reese, a popular all-star from nearby Kentucky. Robinson and Reese, a white southerner, became lifelong friends. Thinking about the things that happened, I don't know any other ball player could have done what he did, to be able to hit with everybody yelling at him. He had to block all that out, block out everything but this ball that is coming in at 100 miles an hour. And he's got a split second to make up his mind if it's in or out or down or coming at his head. A split second to swing. To do what he did has got to be the most tremendous thing I've ever seen in sports. After being awarded gold and bronze medals, respectively, for their performance in the 200-meter sprint at the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City, black U.S. athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos lowered their heads and raised their black gloved fists during the playing of the Star Spangled Banner. Smith and Carlos were subsequently thrown off the U.S. Olympic team, but they were seen as heroes in the black community, and their silent protest against racial discrimination lives on as one of the most iconic images in sports history. We had a platform, and we decided to use it to move forward on human rights. It was not a platform to be used for hate, for us, it was a platform to be used as a cry for freedom. We must survive in a world without warfare. Other athletes saw, and others have come to see, the need for them to become involved on a proactive basis. Our action was not a spur of the moment idea. A year before the Olympic Games, it was organized, planned, and justified. To move forward in a positive way, requires thoughtful conversation, not only between and among individuals, but also between and among nations. We as athletes, who are heroes for many people, have the responsibility to show people a way to keep the world from blowing up. As we started to leave the platform, I felt like I was a free man, and they would never put shackles on me again. John and I were removed from the Olympic team and sent home. We both received death threats, hate mail, suffered unemployment, desperation, and anguish for ourselves and our families. Well, where did you get the gloves? Both gloves belong to Tommy because I'd forgotten to bring mine to the ceremony. I wore the left hand and Tommy wore the right hand, with both hands raised in the air. And what about that third man on the podium? Peter Norman of Australia. When we got out on the victory stand, he was wearing an Olympic project for human rights button, symbolizing his belief in human rights. John and I had the same button on. Now, this man ran a great race. He ran a race of authority, especially the last six meters, to become a silver medalist. When he got back to Australia, which also had problems with blackness, especially with the Aborigine population. He was vilified because he stood on the victory stand with a button on. At Peter Norman's funeral in 2006, Tommy Smith and John Carlos delivered a eulogy and served as pallbearers. At the 1936 Berlin Olympics, designed as a showcase for the Nazi regime, 
Adolf Hitler intended to demonstrate to the world the dominance of the Aryan race. But African track star Jesse Owens became the most successful athlete of the games, winning four gold medals. When I came back to my native country, after all the stories about Hitler, I couldn't ride in front of the bus. I had to go to the back door. I couldn't live where I wanted. Now, I wasn't invited to shake hands with Hitler, but I wasn't invited to the White House to shake hands with the president either. Hitler didn't snub me. It was our president who snubbed me. The president didn't even send a telegram. At the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, terrorists invaded the Olympic Village and, after a standoff, slaughtered the Israeli wrestling team. A shocked world pondered whether the remainder of the game should be canceled. A day after the massacre, International Committee President Avery Brundage issued this decision. <coughs> Every civilized person recoils in horror of the barbarous criminal intrusion of terrorists into the peaceful Olympic precincts. We mourn our Israeli friends, victims of this brutal assault. The Olympic flag and the flags of all the world fly at half-mast. Sadly, in this imperfect world, the greater and more important the Olympic Games become, the more they are open to commercial, political, and now criminal pressure. We have only the strength of a great ideal. I'm sure the public will agree that we cannot allow a handful of terrorists to destroy this nucleus of international cooperation and goodwill we have in the Olympic movement. The Games must go on, and we must continue our efforts to keep them clean, pure, and honest and try to extend the sportsmanship of the athletic field to other ideas. We declare today a day of mourning and we'll continue all the events one day later than scheduled. Hank Greenberg, a great slugger, played baseball for the Detroit Tigers in the years leading to World War II. When I came to feel that if I, as a Jew, hit a home run, I was hitting one against Hitler. Sandy Koufax, superlative pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, refused to pitch on Yom Kippur for religious reasons. <clears throat> Consequently, he declined to start for the Dodgers in the first game of the 1965 World Series against the Minnesota Twins. Even though Koufax was far from devout, his stand garnered respect and praise, especially from American Jews. Don Drysdale, who pitched in his stead that Day of Atonement, was no slouch, having won 23 games that year, but the Twins clobbered him, mounting a 7-1 lead in the third inning. When manager Robert Alston came to the mound to take him out of the game, Drysdale said, I bet you wish I was Jewish too. <laughs> it wasn't only Adolf Hitler who saw the propaganda value in athletic success. During the Cold War, communist countries bent the rules in order to establish that their system of government produced the best athletes. Shirley Babishoff, an American champion swimmer, competed against the East German teams in the 1970s. At the 1973 World Championships, the East German women suddenly started beating us, and none of the races was close. These women looked like shot putters and wrestlers. We didn't know what was going on. Babishoff next encountered the East Germans three years later at the 1976 Montreal Olympics. We were just changing into our swimsuits, and we went into what we thought was the women's locker room. And then we heard these voices nearby, and they sounded just like men. And, and we just shrieked and said, oh my gosh, this must be like a co-ed locker room or something. We got dressed really quickly, and we looked around the corner, and it was the East German women. After the reunification of Germany, it was revealed that the East German government had been systematically feeding the women steroids without telling them what they'd been given. They won numerous medals, but at the expense of their long-term health. In 
1930, Babe Ruth demanded from the New York Yankees a salary in excess of $80,000. Babe, you may be the best baseball player on earth, but how can you demand a salary higher than that of President Herbert Hoover? What the hell, what the hell does Hoover have to do with it? Besides, I had a better year than he did. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The hand can't hit what the eye can't see. Muhammad Ali. In 1967, at the height of his career, Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion and sometime poet, refused a call to serve in the U.S. Army. He was promptly stripped of his belt. The chairman of the New York State Athletic Commission and the president of the World Boxing Association <coughs> defended the action. Muhammad Ali's refusal to enter the service is regarded by the commission to be detrimental to the best interests of boxing. And I feel that Muhammad Ali has defied the laws of the United States regarding selective service. His action today leaves me no alternative. Ali was arrested and found guilty of draft evasion. Muhammad, why did you refuse to be inducted into the army? I ain't got no quarrel with him being calm. No Viet Cong ever called me as The judgment against Ali was subsequently overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. He returned to boxing and regained his heavyweight title. In recent years, political activity by professional American athletes has been on the rise. In 2016, San Francisco 49er quarterback Colin Kaepernick began taking a knee during pregame national anthem starting a protest movement that drew a response from the president himself. I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street, and cops are getting away with murder. I am not looking for approval. I have to stand up for people that are oppressed, if they take football away by endorsements from me, I know that I stood up for what is right. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners, when somebody disrespects our flag, to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired! The crowd of Trump supporters erupted in cheers, and no NFL team has signed Kaepernick since he became a free agent in 2017. Steph Curry, your Golden State Warriors won the championship of the National Basketball Association and have been invited to visit the White House by President Trump. You say you won't go. What does that mean? We don't stand for what our president has said and the things that he hasn't said. Hopefully, that will inspire some change when it comes to what we tolerate in this country, what is accepted, and what we turn a blind eye to. As athletes, we do what we can. We're using our platforms to shed light on that. I don't think us not going to the White House is going to miraculously make everything better, but this is my opportunity to voice my opinion. Uh, going to the White House is considered a great honor for a championship team. Steph Curry is hesitating. Therefore, the invitation is withdrawn. Sports spawns popular heroes, and baseball, our national pastime, is responsible for more than its share. Beginning in 1888, with Ernest Lawrence Thayer's classic poem, Casey at the Bat. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning left to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a hoodoo, the latter was a cake. 
So upon that stricken multitude grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despiser, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it pounded on the mountain, and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, I think Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing, and a smile at Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt. Was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then, while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in hockey grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black of people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult, he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the man in thousands, and they got answering, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's that you say, Mrs. Robinson? Jolton Joe has left and gone away. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. DiMaggio himself didn't comprehend the meaning of the passage from Simon and Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson. Paul Simon explained. The line was meant as a sincere tribute to Joe DiMaggio's unpretentious, heroic stature in a time when popular culture magnifies and distorts how we perceive our heroes. We grieve for Joe DiMaggio and mourn the loss of his grace and dignity, his fierce sense of privacy, his fidelity to the memory of his wife, and the power of his silence. A footnote to Casey at the back. In 1979, sports writer Leonard Copper claimed that Ernest Lawrence Thayer's poem originally contained some extra lines. According to Copley, in the original version, just before striking out, Casey winked to his uncle, who was in the stands taking bets. In other words, some 30 years before the Black Sox scandal rocked the baseball world, the poet's legendary Casey struck out on purpose. He threw the game. So much for heroes. Still, there's no denying the cultural significance of fandom. Witness the following song, 
by Jack Norworth about a baseball fanatic, a song which has been ingrained in America's consciousness for over 100 years. Katie Casey was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad, just to root for the home team crew every suit. Katie Blue. On a Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show. But Miss Kate said, no, I'll tell you what you can do. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never get back and these root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three stripes around in the old ball game. Everybody, take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crackers, Jack. I don't care if I ever get back to these group. Group, group for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three stripes around in the old ball game. At Ali, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact Ali today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive.